Actually, we're ending a series today that we've simply titled Broken. And the truth being that we all are broken by our sin. And we are in desperate need of rescue. But God in His grace has come in and rescued us. In the first message, we saw that brokenness. We saw as the song we sang just a few moments ago, the idea that we're jars of clay. And it's through our brokenness that God actually shines the truth of the Gospel. We don't have to fake that we're perfect. We don't have to fake that we have it all together. God can take our brokenness and use it for His honor and for His glory. In the second message, we saw that God responds to our brokenness with grace. He doesn't respond with anger. He responds with grace. And Brad said so articulately that grace is not something that we earn, so grace is not something that we can lose. God's grace is available to us each and every day. Last week we saw the idea of uh, that baggage that we're carrying. We can actually let go and we can roll that baggage over onto God. The simple truth is that it's easier for us to accept God's forgiveness than it is for us to forgive ourselves. And honest, uh, honestly, we often live with that guilt and that fear and that depression and other baggage. And uh, we saw the fact that the psalmist said, cast your burden on the Lord. Peter said, cast all of your anxieties on Him, for He cares for you. Today we conclude the series seeing that we are free. We are absolutely free in Jesus Christ. And so if you have your Bible, take, with, take it with me and turn to John chapter 8. We're going to look at a few verses. If you have your iPhone, your iPad, we'll put them up on the screen in just a few moments. But we're going to see the idea that Jesus has set us free today. So let's have a, a word of prayer this morning and we'll delve into the passage. John, John chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Let's pray. Father, we love You. Lord, thank You that You have placed the truth of the Gospel in jars of clay. Father, we're not perfect. We're certainly not strong enough. As a matter of fact, we're weak and we are easily shattered. But thank You that when Jesus breaks into our lives, when He rescues us by His grace, He desires to do a work of transformation in our lives that only He can do. Lord, today I pray that we would, that we would understand the freedom that we have in Jesus. As Paul says, help us to stand fast in the liberty which with Jesus has made us Lord, help us to understand that truth today. Pray for those here today who, for some reason, claim to be believers, but there's never been a work of transformation in their life. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God can speak to them today. I pray for those of us who are enslaved, who are handcuffed to sin today. Help us to realize that Jesus has not only freed us from the penalty of sin, but through the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, He has freed us from the power of sin as well. And we can be free in Jesus. Help us to understand that this morning. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So if you're familiar with American history, you're familiar with the fact that um, our history is filled with inspiring declarations of freedom. You can quote some of these. Patrick Henry stood and said... Give me liberty, you can probably finish it. Give me liberty or give me death. I love the words, I'd never read this before, I love the words of Harriet Tubman who uh, was involved in the Underground Railroad and was involved in freeing so many slaves. Notice this quote, she said, If you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. If there is shouting after you, keep going. Don't ever stop, keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep going. Isn't that a great quote? Abraham Lincoln signed in 1863 the Emancipation Proclamation. And I won't read it because it's just a little bit wordy, but he says, from this time forward and from this point and forevermore shall slaves be free in our country. 
And all of us are familiar with the powerful words of Martin Luther King. As he stood there in Washington and he said, free at last, free at last, praise God Almighty, we are free at last. Freedom is something to cherish, is it not? Freedom is something to hold dear. In the passage of Scripture that we're studying today, though, Jesus gives us one of those phenomenal declarations of freedom. He's not talking about freedom as we possess necessarily here in the United States of America. He's not talking about patriotism. He's not talking about political freedom. But rather, He's talking about spiritual freedom. How in Him, you and I can truly experience freedom. So if you're with me, we're in John chapter 8, and let's just kind of read through this passage and kind of apply it to our lives this morning. So beginning in verse 31, John 8, 31, we'll put it up on the screen. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in Him, I want to put this in context, if you go back to the preceding verse, we won't put it up on the screen. So as Jesus was preaching, verse 30 says, and as He was saying these things, many believed in Him. And we're going to flesh that out in just a second. So, verse 31, Jesus then begins addressing the Jews who said that they believed in Him. Here's what Jesus said. If you abide in My Word, you are truly My disciples. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Isn't that a great verse? Let me read that verse again. He says, he tells them, and obviously he tells us as the message of the gospel transcends through time, and you will know the truth. And it is the truth that will set you free. What is the response then? They answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham. We have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you tell us that we will become free? I'll read the rest of the passage in just a moment, but if we jump down to verse 36, he makes this statement and he says this, So if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. So let's flesh that out this morning. Great, great truth. By the way, that's a great verse, great passage of Scripture to learn. So, as I flesh this out, just a couple of really practical things that I think um, are where we live today. The first is this, if you have your outline. The first is this, we are often oblivious to the things that enslave us. Think about that today. We are often oblivious, ignorant. For some reason, our head is in the sand. We are oblivious to the things that enslave us. The response of these Jewish listeners in this passage to me is actually humorous. Jesus is speaking of captivity. He's speaking of bondage. He's talking about then that He has come to free people from their bondage. And these Jewish individuals who, it says, had just previously believed in Him, call Jesus out. And in verse 33, they look at Him and say, whoa, 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 whoa. We've never been enslaved to anyone. Who are you to tell us that we can become free. I read that, and if you know anything about Jewish history, that's humorous, because I sat back, and here's what I wrote in my notes. Were they not paying attention in Jewish history class? (laughs) If you know anything about the Jewish people, you know that they have a long history of what? Of oppression, of conquest, and captivity. Just to give you a very brief Jewish history lesson, They were slaves in Egypt. Remember that. Between 740 and 722 B.C., the northern tribes of Israel were conquered and taken captive by the Assyrians. In 586 B.C., the southern kingdom was conquered and taken captive by the Babylonians. And at this very moment, in John chapter 8, while Jesus is talking and they are responding to Him, the Jewish people were living under Roman rule. They'd been conquered in 63 B.C. And so they have this long history of being conquered. They have this long history of being captives, of being in bondage. And yet they have the audacity to look at Jesus and say, 
What are you talking about? We've never been enslaved uh, to anyone. Jesus responded so graciously because I would have looked at him and said, get your head out of the sand. Of course you have been in bondage. What in the world were these people thinking? They were either ignorant, oblivious, or hard-headed. I sat back as I contemplated on that and I thought, wow, how often do we act the exact same way? By the way, in the passage, Jesus is not talking about political freedom. He's not looking at the Jews and saying, listen, you need to be liberated from the Romans. That's not what He's talking about. He's talking about spiritual freedom. And He's talking about the fact, and it's actually demonstrated in the passage, that we often are oblivious to the things that enslave us. We often are oblivious to the things that hold us captive. We act as if we're free. We pretend that we are free when in reality we're captive to something or we are captive to someone in our life. So as we begin this morning, can I ask you a real personal question? Would you be honest with yourself? Would you be reflective this morning? Let me ask you a personal question. Is there something in your life that has you in bondage. Think about that today. Would you be honest with yourself? Is there something in your life that has you in bondage? You might sit back and say, Brian, what are you worried? What in the world are you talking about? Talking about your thought life, guys, that you just can't get a grip on? And even though you know that you shouldn't be thinking that, you do. Pride? Thank you. Ego? Are you talking to me or those things that I'm struggling with? (laughs) My mom used to always say, when we were growing up, my mom used to say, I think I've said this before, we don't have a problem with pride in our family because Brian has it all. So, so yeah, so uh, I get that. I struggle with that. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's uncontrolled tongue. Maybe maybe it's an ungodly response. Maybe it's an addiction. Something in your life that you sit back and you act as if you have it all together. You pretend as if you have it all together. You come to church and you can stand up and you can speak eloquently. And man, man, you're not prone to talk about your weaknesses because you want everybody to think you have it all together. But on the inside, you're broken. And on the inside, you're enslaved. You and I, if we're not careful, we have the tendency, just like these Jewish people, to look at Jesus and say, what are you talking about? I have never been enslaved to anyone or anything. Let me encourage you today, don't ignore it. Don't pretend as if it's not there. Don't convince yourself that there's not a problem in your life. Here's the answer today. Turn it over to Jesus. And allow Jesus to give you the freedom. That's the message of the passage of Scripture that we're studying today. There's a second truth in these first three verses before we jump into the second part of the passage is that Jesus describes here the characteristics of a true disciple. Not my words, Jesus' words. Remember verse 30 said, as He was saying these things, many believed on Him and And so many of these people liked the words that He said. They liked the miracles that He performed. They liked the fact that He could take five loaves and two fishes and feed 5,000 people. Who wouldn't want to believe in somebody like that? They claimed to be His followers. Jesus responds with this statement. He says, If you abide in My words, you are truly My disciple. And you, if you're my disciple, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. What was Jesus saying? He was looking at the people who were listening to Him and He's saying, you know what? Evidently your belief is not as solid as you claim for it to be. What does that show us? I put it this way in the notes very simply. That there are many who claim to believe 
but are not actual followers of Jesus. There are many who claim to believe who are not actual followers of Jesus. Just because you claim to be a Christian does not make you one. Today, people claim to be all kinds of things. We hear in the news of untrained individuals who claim to be doctors. We find them performing, but they've had no training. They've had no medical degree. You might remember last year, the year before, there was a woman, I think she was in Seattle, Washington, a white Caucasian lady who claimed to be African American. Remember that story? Phone scammers call us on a regular basis and claim to be the IRS. When was the last time you got one of those calls? Hey, we even understand this because... The Miami Dolphins claim to be professional football players. Huh? That was low. That was that was low, wasn't it? Apologies to all the Miami Dolphins fans. Go Dolphins. We want them to win today. Here's what Jesus is saying. Just because you claim to be something doesn't mean that you are. Listen, the statistics bear it out in South Florida. We've quoted the statistics. Some 60% of the people who live in South Florida would self-identify themselves as believers. And yet only 15% attend church on a regular basis. And even of the 15% who attend church on a regular basis, their life is not living out the truth of the Gospel. George Barna, who's the who's the pollster, the religious pollster, says in South Florida, the actual number is 3%. Of the people who live in South Florida that, that, that adhere to the foundations, the fundamental truths of the faith, and their life has truly been transformed by the truth of the Gospel. Here's what, here's what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8. "This people honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me. The Apostle Paul said this in Titus chapter 1 and verse 16. They profess that they know God, but they deny Him by their works. See, this morning, you may be able to fool others, but you cannot fool God. You might be able to say you're a believer. You might be able to act like a believer. You might be able to say all of the words. You might be able to sing the songs. You might be able to come to church on a regular basis. You might be able to act as if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. But Jesus knows, God knows who are the goats and who are the sheep. As God looks out across His church this morning as it meets all across South Florida, and as it meets all across our country and across the world, He knows who are His. These individuals claim to believe, but Jesus looked at them and said, "You claim to believe. But here's what a true disciple is. A true disciple abides by my words. Let me give you one more verse before we jump into that. Jesus said this in Matthew 7.21. He says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father. In other words, he's saying you can claim to be whatever you want. We use it all the time. It's just a simple little humorous adage. But just because you sleep in a garage doesn't make you a car, right? Just because you say you're something doesn't mean you are what you say So here's what Jesus is telling the people who are following Him and listening to Him. He's saying, examine your life. Examine your life. And He says two things about a true disciple in the passage. He says this, a true disciple abides in the words of Jesus. Notice, that's what He said in verse verse 31. If you abide in My words, you are truly My disciples. Let me read a couple of other translations. The NIV says, if you hold to My teaching, you're My disciple. The NASB says, if you continue in My Word, you are My disciple. The contemporary English version says, if you keep on obeying what I have said, you are My disciple. The word abide that he uses here has the idea of remaining. 
It has the idea of staying. It has the idea of waiting, of locking yourself in and saying, this is where I live. All of us left our homes this morning. Our homes are where we abide. Our homes are where we lay our head down at night. That is our life. Here's what Jesus says. True disciples of mine abide where? They abide in my words. My, or in other words, we can flip it without doing damage to the text. My words abide in them. They not only abide in my words, but my words abide in them. Here, here's what Jesus is saying. A, a disciple of Jesus Christ has a hunger for the Word of God. Listen, it doesn't mean that, that they're going to spend you know hours a day reading God's Word. I realize we have life, we have responsibilities, we have work. But you understand that these right here are the words of life. And you realize that you cannot live your life. You cannot satisfy Him. You cannot grow in your walk with Him without what? Without spending time in His Word. You, you know what? You know what they say about today's church? And this isn't me that's saying, we're saying that today our generation of believers. Our generation is the most biblically illiterate generation in the history of the church. Why is that? We have so many things that distract us. Man, in New Testament times, they didn't have televisions to turn on. They didn't have Facebook to scroll through. They didn't have Google to Google something. I'm sure they had other distractions, but not near what we have. We have so many things that clamor for our attention that if we're not careful, the words of Jesus Christ become unimportant to us. You see, I would sit back and we classify, we characterize what's a Christian. We would say, well, somebody who goes to church this many times. I would flip that a little bit and I would say a Christian is not just somebody who attends church and sees the importance of meeting together with God's people, but a Christian is someone who, who converses with God on a regular basis and allows God to speak to them through His are you doing that? He says, a true disciple abides in my words. He says a second thing here. The second thing is this, if you're following along, a true disciple knows the truth. And that truth has set them free. You sit back and say, okay, Brian, Jesus is speaking ambiguously. What is he talking about? I, I would say two things and we can prove it scripture. First of all, the truth is a person. He said later on in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. Nobody comes to God except through me. So to know the truth means that you know Jesus. You have a personal relationship with Him. He's not just somebody that you sing about on Sunday morning, but who's somebody that you talk with during the course of the week. It's someone with whom you have an ongoing relationship. You hear us talk about it all the time, that to be a follower of Jesus Christ is not about religion. It's about a relationship. And a relationship is something that we have 24-7. Vicki and I, we've been married for 35 years, right? 35 years. I mean, what kind of relationship would it be if I told her, you know what, man? I'm going to see you every single Sunday. Well, not every Sunday, because there's Sundays that the Dolphins play, and I'm not going to be able to see you on those Sundays. So three, well, there's also going to be Sundays that, you know, there's family activities. I'm going to see you whenever I'm able to. What kind of relationship would that be? That would be a terrible relationship. And sometimes it, that's the way we view our relationship with God, and yet God wants us to walk with Him, to talk with Him, to have an ongoing relationship with Him as a person. He wants you to know Him and have a relationship with Him. I would say also that the truth is found in His Word, His way of life. John 17, 17, He says, Sanctify them in your truth. Your Word is truth. So, so let me ask you today, this is really introspective. I want you to be honest with yourself and allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to your heart today. And the truth is this. The question is this. 
Has your life been changed by the truth of the Gospel? Is your life being changed? Probably a better question. Is your life being changed by the truth of the Gospel? Are you sitting back today and say, I recognize the Word of God as the guide of my life. I recognize Him as the Lord of my life. And I am His disciple. I am His See, what Jesus shows us in the passage very simply is this. Not everybody who claims to be a disciple is. True disciples abide in His words. True disciples know the truth. And the truth will set them free. Notice we continue in the passage in verse 34. Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Let me read that again. That's a really powerful truth. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to that sin. So, so if you have your outline, so here's what I put in your outline. To habitually commit a sin enslaves you to that sin. I love how the ESV translates it. He says everyone who practices, he doesn't use the word commit. Some of the older translations says everyone who commits sin is a slave to that sin. And the idea is, oh my word, I committed the sin one time so I'm enslaved. No, the idea is practice. The idea is to habitually commit this sin on a regular basis. If you habitually do the same thing over and over again, if there's a sin that seems to dominate your life, whether it's anger, whether it's pride, whether it's ego, whether it's you know cursing, whether it's an addiction, whatever it is, if there is a sin that predominantly affects your life on a regular basis, you are enslaved to that sin. I want to illustrate this in a simple, goofy way. I'm going to ask Carrie if she would come forward. Carrie, would you come forward? Carrie is one of Hollywood's finest. Let's give it up for this is Carrie Sibiona. One of the police officers from the city of Hollywood. So we have a police officer here every week. So I'm going to ask Carrie to do something. We kind of uh, argued about this a little bit. Hey, Carrie. And let's let her know once again how much we appreciate her. All right? So I've asked Carrie to put handcuffs on me this morning. All right, so Carrie, would you handcuff me, please? She told me, she said, no, I can't do that. I said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. So would you put handcuffs on me this morning? By the way, as far as I know, this is the first time I've ever been handcuffed in my entire life. Carla, please, no pictures, all right? I can see this going viral all over. All right, all right. Ouch, ouch! No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. All right, so, so if you've ever had handcuffs on before, you, you know what? Man, there's not a lot of freedom here, all right? I can't do a lot, all right? I am... I am I am bound by these handcuffs, right? So, 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 so if you gave me a glass of water, I couldn't drink it. If you put a steak in front of me, I couldn't eat it. If you said, Brian, drive down to the store and drive down to the store, I can't do it. Why is that? I'm handcuffed, all right? I'm, I, I am bound by these handcuffs right now. Right? So here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying if you commit a habitual sin in your life, on a regular basis, you are enslaved to that sin. You are handcuffed to that sin. All right, I think we got the point. Here, would you please free me? Would you please free me? Ah, she forgot the key. She forgot the key. All right, Brad, would you come up and finish the message? They're going to cart me away today. I really would hope and pray that we don't see that on social media later today, all right? We're going to have to explain. We're going to have to explain that. Listen, simple illustration. So apply that to your life. Is there a sin in your life that it seems like in day after day after day, rather than me experiencing the victory over this, the sin, this temptation, is experiencing or is is winning the victory over? Jesus said, if you practice a sin, 
you were enslaved. Strong word. I know the whole idea of slavery in our country is a strong picture. It's the term that Jesus uses. If you habitually commit a sin, you are bound. You are enslaved to that sin. And if we stopped it right there, that would be incredibly depressing. The simple truth is, as we'll see in a moment, that's not where Jesus wants us to live. Jesus doesn't want us to live a handcuffed, limited life where we can only do so much. Imagine if you were, if you spent time in prison. You spent time in prison, and whether you spent you know, one year, two years, five years, ten years, whatever it was, you spent time in prison, and finally the day of your release comes. And, and the jailer, the officer comes and he puts the key in your cell and he opens up your cell and opens the door and says, you're a free man. You're a free woman. And you walk outside the cell and you kind of look back and you think, you know what? I liked it in there. I'm going to go back in there. You know what? I think I'm just going to stay. This is a great place to be. That would be ludicrous, would it not? I am free, and yet I choose to remain incarcerated. I, I'm not experiencing the freedom that has been granted to me. That's what Jesus is talking about in the passage. And, and He's talking to believers here. He said, listen, he said, listen, you've experienced freedom in Christ. We've already seen that. We'll see it again. Why are you allowing yourself to be handcuffed? Why are you allowing yourself? We'll see that at the end of the message in Galatians chapter 5. Why are you allowing yourself to be entangled again with a yoke of bondage? Live in the freedom that you have in Jesus Christ. Great, great story in history. If you know much about European history in the 14th century, there was a there was a ruler over now what is Belgium. He was called Reynald the Third. He was duke, and there was a violent quarrel between him and his brother Edward. And Edward actually won the quarrel, revolted against him, and built a special room to imprison Reynald. And and in the room, he built windows and he built a door. And he told Reynald, he said, "Here's the deal." You can leave any time you want. And the moment you leave that prison, you get all of your property back. You get everything back that you previously had. Sounds like a pretty good deal, right? There was one big problem. Reynald was a really big man. And he built the doors really small. And so, in order for Reynald to experience his freedom, he had to what? He had to overcome his addiction to food. And so Reynald said, the doors are wide open. You can leave any time you want. But what Edward did is he kept feeding his brother all the delicacies of the kingdom. And every single day he would put this banquet for his brother and his brother enjoyed all of the food. And he not only decreased in size, he increased in size. And he was never able to escape the prison that he was in, even though the doors were wide open, because he was, uh, he was incarcerated not to the prison, but he was incarcerated to his own appetite. And he never wanted to break. Sit back and think, how often are we like Reynald the third? The door is there open for us, but we prefer the things that keep us we prefer the things that keep us incarcerated. Listen, here's what Jesus is saying in the passage. To habitually commit a sin enslaves you to that sin. If we end it right there, once again, that would be incredibly depressing. But Jesus does it. Notice verse 34, once again, Truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Verse 35, The slave does not remain in the house forever, the Son remains forever. Let me just flesh that out for, for, for just a second. There's actually two interpretations of that. The first is that 
Jesus is contrasting an heir with a slave. And he's saying this, the slave does not have personal access to the house. The slave does not have freedom. And many commentators believe that Jesus is specifically referring to Abraham's household, to which they alluded to in the passage, saying to them, if they were really children of Abraham, if they were sons and not heirs, they would live like children of Abraham and they would experience the freedom that God gives them. But because even though they're sons, they're acting like slaves, they find themselves incarcerated. The other application is found in verse 36 where Jesus says this, But if the Son sets you free, you will be free. There's not only an Old Testament law application there, but the application very simply is this. The Son is a reference to Jesus Christ as the eternal Son. He is the one who sets us free. The Son has set you free. You are free in. Let me do two theological points. We'll pull it together in a practical way, but I want to illustrate it when we're done today. The first is this, if you're following along in your notes. Because of Jesus, you are forgiven and made right with God. Because of Jesus, you are forgiven and made right with God. You're forgiven not because you deserve it. You're forgiven not because you become better. You're forgiven not because, okay, I've decided that I'm going to stop doing these things, and so, God, please forgive me. No, you are forgiven not because of who you are. You are forgiven because of who Jesus is. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, and we'll look at verse 2 in just a second. In Romans 8 and 1, he says, There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The theological term is justification. We talked about it last week. When you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are declared righteous, you are declared perfect, in the sight of God, catch this, just as if you never, ever, ever sinned. Your old sins are wiped away. Your future sins are wiped away. And when God the Father looks at you right now, He doesn't see that unrighteousness that you and I continue to demonstrate. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which has been placed into our account. We are justified in the sight of God just as if we never, ever sinned. Romans 8.1 talks about justification, but Romans 8.2 talks about sanctification. And by the way, I'm starting a class this Wednesday night. Let me, um, let me promote it. It's called Changed into His Image. We're going to be looking the next five weeks at the doctrine of sanctification. We're going to be right here in the auditorium. I'd encourage you to come as we flesh that out. But the first truth is because of Jesus, you're forgiven and made right with God. That's justification. The second truth is this. Because of Jesus, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit and made free from the power of sin. Romans 8.1, you're free from the penalty of sin. Romans 8.2, you're free from the power of sin. Read, read that verse with me. Romans 8.2, we'll put it up on the screen. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free. How? in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So the first thing is, because of Jesus, you are declared righteous. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you repent of your sin, and you turn by faith to Jesus. You are justified in the sight of God. You're made righteous just as if you never, ever sinned. The penalty of sin is taken. If that's all that God did, we'd sit back and shout, Amen! Glory to God! That's not all we did. He looked at you and I because of His love and He gave us His Holy Spirit who indwells us. Because of Jesus, the indwelling Holy Spirit lives within us. And He does this. Catch this. He frees us from the power of sin. In life. That's what He's talking about. When the Son has set you free, you are free. The sad thing is that many of us live incarcerated to our sins when we have complete freedom in Jesus Christ. We're trying. It's not like we're not trying. We're trying to do the very best that we can. We're trying to overcome our sins. We don't like 
it when we blow up and we demonstrate anger. We don't like it when we give in and look at something on the internet that we shouldn't. We don't like it when we respond in this way. We don't like it when that addiction seems to take hold of our life and we want to overcome it and we're trying it, but we're frustrated because we just can't do it. And we've tried for years. I've lived there. And the key is that you will never be able to do it. You don't have the power to do it. But the Holy Spirit of God does. And God has placed within you the Holy Spirit to empower you. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, was preaching to a large crowd and he held up a glass. I don't have a glass with me today. He held up a glass and asked the congregation, how can I get the air out of this glass? And, and, and people began yelling responses, do this, do that. Someone actually yelled out, suck it out with a pump. And D.L. Moody responds, no, that'd create a vacuum and it would actually break the glass. After many numerous other suggestions, Moody smiled and picked up a pitcher of water and filled the glass. There, he said. All the air is now in Now, science teachers, I know there's probably still air in water. It's made out of H2O, so I get all of that. He looked and he said, there, all the air is He then went on to explain that victory in the Christian life is not accomplished by sucking the sin out of our lives, but by being filled with the Holy Spirit. convinced that as believers we try to do it on our own. We try everything we can to suck the sin, whether it's blatant sins, whether it's unconscious sins, whether it's something so sinful that we're ashamed of, or just a battle that we can never overcome. And God knows we struggle with it and we use every ounce of our strength to try to suck the sin out and we cannot get it out of our life. Jesus is saying, I know. The answer is not in you getting the sin out of your life. The answer is you putting the Holy Spirit of God into your life. To be filled with the Spirit. And to live not with your own power, but His power. That's why Paul said, for me to live is Christ." It's not me. It's Him living through me. So the answer is not I wake up every day saying, okay, this is the day that I'm overcoming this. Or this is the day that I'm going to stop doing this. Or this is the day that I'm going to start doing this. I wake up in the morning and I recognize that I'm broken. And as Glenn said, I have a desperation for God. And I reach out to God and say, God, I've tried this for too long on my own. I just can't do it. Today I'm asking that the Holy Spirit of God would do something in me and through me that I have never been able to do myself. Today I surrender myself to the Holy Spirit. Today I ask for you to do the work in my life. Paul says, you're free from the penalty of sin. There's no condemnation. But you're free from the power of sin. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed me from the law of the sin. So here's what Jesus says. You're free. And who the Son has set free, you are free. Walk out the doors of that prison and experience the freedom. Am I saying today that you can walk out of here and never sin again? No. You know why? Because you live in a body of flesh. There's a struggle that you face each and every day. But, uh, But I would tell you this, that the more you surrender yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the more Jesus' words abide in you and bounce around in your head, in your mind, and in your heart, the more they guide you, the more you become like you. You are 
changed into his image. Here's what Paul said in Galatians 5 when Jonah 17 came out. Paul says in Galatians 5 stand fast. Stand fast in the liberty that you have in Christ Jesus. Let me say, stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And don't be entangled again to a yoke of bondage. Jesus has set you free. My faith, claim freedom. It's available.